Vladimir Vladimirovich Mayakovsky was a Russian Soviet poet, playwright, artist and stage and film actor. During his early, pre-revolution period leading into 1917, Mayakovsky became renowned as a prominent figure of the Russian Futurist movement. Being among the signers of the Futurist Manifesto, a slap in the face of public taste, and authoring poems such as A Cloud in Trousers and Backbone Flute. Mayakovsky produced a large and diverse body of work during the course of his career, he wrote poems, wrote and directed plays, appeared in films, edited the art journal LEF, and created agitprop posters in support of the Communist Party during the Russian Civil War. Though Mayakovsky's work regularly demonstrated ideological and patriotic support for the ideology of the Communist Party and a strong admiration of Lenin, Mayakovsky's relationship with the Soviet state was always complex and often tumultuous. Mayakovsky often found himself engaged in confrontation with the increasing involvement of the Soviet state in cultural censorship and the development of the state doctrine of socialist realism. Works that contained criticism or satire of aspects of the Soviet system, such as the poem Talking with the Taxman about poetry, and the plays The Bed Bug and the Bathhouse, were met with scorn by the Soviet state and literary establishment. In 1930 Mayakovsky committed suicide. Even after death his relationship with the Soviet state remained unsteady. Though Mayakovsky had previously been harshly criticized by Stalinist governmental bodies like RAPP, Joseph Stalin posthumously declared Mayakovsky, the best and the most talented poet of our Soviet epoch. Biography Vladimir Vladimirovich Mayakovsky was born the last of three children in Bad Arti, Kutaisi Governorate, Georgia, then part of the Russian Empire. His father Vladimir Konstantinovich Mayakovsky, a local forester, belonged to a noble family and was a distant relative of the writer Grigory Danilovsky. Vladimir Vladimirovich's mother Alexandra Alexulovna, was a housewife, looking after children a year a son and two daughters, Olga and Lyudmila. The family had Russian and Zaporozhian Cossack descent on their father's side and Ukrainian on their mother's. At home the family spoke Russian. With his friends and at school Mayakabi used Georgian. I was born in the Caucasus, my father is a Cossack, my mother is Ukrainian. My mother tongue is Georgian. Thus three cultures are united in me, he told the Prague newspaper Praga Press in a 1927 interview. Georgia for Mayakovsky remained the eternal symbol of beauty. I know, it's nonsense, Eden and Paradise, but since people sang about them it must have been Georgia, the joyful land, that those poets were having in mind, he wrote later. In 1902 Mayakovsky joined the Kite Gymnasium where, as a 14-year-old he took part in socialist demonstrations at the town of Kitezi. His mother, aware of his activities, apparently didn't mind. People around warned us we were giving a young boy too much freedom. But I saw him developing according to the new trends, sympathized with him and pandered to his aspirations, she later remembered. After the sudden and premature death of his father in 1906 the family Yura Mayakovsky, his mother, and his two sisters Yura moved to Moscow after selling all their movable property. In July 1906 Mayakovsky joined the fourth form of the Moscow's fifth classic gymnasium and soon developed a passion for Marxist literature. Never cared for fiction. For me it was philosophy, Hegel, natural sciences, but first and foremost, Marxism. There'd be no higher art for me than the four art by Marx, he recalled in the 1920s in his autobiography I, Myself. In 1907 Mayakovsky became a member of his gymnasium's underground Social Democrat circle, taking part in numerous activities of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party which he, given the nickname Comrade Konstantin, joined the same year. In 1908, the boy was dismissed from the gymnasium because his mother was no longer able to afford the tuition fees. For two years he studied at the Stroganov School of Industrial Arts where his sister Lyudmila had started her studies a few years earlier. As a young Bolshevik activist, Mayakovsky distributed propaganda leaflets, possessed a pistol without a license, and in 1909 got involved in smuggling female political prisoners out of prison. This resulted in a series of arrests and finally an 11-month imprisonment. 
It was in a solitary confinement at the Moscow Butika prison that Mayakovsky started writing verses for the first time. Revolution and poetry got entangled in my head and became one, he wrote in the I, myself autobiography. As an underage person, Mayakovsky avoided a serious prison sentence and in January 1910 was released. A warden confiscated the young man's notebook, and years later Mayakovsky conceded that was all for the better, yet he always cited 1909 as the year his literary career started. Upon his release from prison, Mayakovsky remained an ardent socialist, but realized his own inadequacy as a serious revolutionary. Having left the party, he concentrated on education. I stopped my party activities. Sat down and started to learn a year and now my intention was to make the socialist art, he later remembered. In 1911 Mayakovsky enrolled in the Moscow Art School. In September 1911 a brief encounter with fellow student David Berliuk led to lasting friendship and had historic consequences for the nascent Russian Futurist movement. Mayakovsky became an active member for the group Gillies, which sought to free the arts from academic traditions, its members would read poetry on street corners, throw tea at their audiences, and make their public appearances an annoyance for the art establishment. Berliuk, on having heard Mayakovsky's verses, declared him a genius poet. Later Soviet researchers tried to downplay the significance of the fact, but even after their friendship ended and their ways parted, Mayakovsky continued to give credit to his mentor, referring to him as my wonderful friend. It was Berliuk who turned me into a poet. He read the French and the Germans to me. He pressed books on me. He would come and talk endlessly. He didn't let me get away. He would subside me with fifty cocks each day so as a euro unregistered trademark D right and not be hungry, Mayakovsky wrote in I, myself. Equals literary career equals. On November 17, 1912, Mayakovsky made his first public performance on stage of the Stray Dog Artistic Basement in St. Petersburg. In December of that year his first published poems, Night and Morning appeared in the Futurists' Manifesto a slap in the face of public taste, signed by Mayakovsky, as well as Vilamir Klubnikov, David Berliuk and Alexei Kruchy Nike, calling among other things for a Euro throwing Pushkin, Dostoyevsky, Tolstoy, etc., etc., off the steamboat of the modernity. In October 1913 Mayakovsky gave the performance at the Pink Lantern Cafe copyright, reciting his new poem Take That for the first time. The concert at the Petersburg's Lunar Park saw the premiere of the poetic monodrama Vladimir Mayakovsky, with the author in a leading role, stage decorations designed by Pavel Filinov and Yosef Shkolnik. In 1913 Mayakovsky's first poetry collection called I came out, its original limited edition 300 copies lithographically printed. This four-poem cycle, handwritten and illustrated by Vesely Chkrijan and Leo Schechtel, later formed part one of the 1916 compilation Simple as Mooing. In December 1913 year Mayakovsky along with his fellow Futurist group members embarked on the Russian tour, which took them to 17 cities, including Simferopol, Sevastopol, Kerch, Odessa and Kishinov. It was a riotous affair. The audiences would go wild and often the police stopped the readings. The poets dressed outlandishly, and Mayakovsky, a regular scandal maker in his own words, used to appear on stage in a self-made yellow shirt which became the token of his early stage persona. The tour ended on April 13, 1914 in Kalaga and cost Mayakovsky and Burley up their education. Both were expelled from the art school for their public appearances deemed incompatible with the school's academic principles. They learned of it while in Poltava from the local police chief who chose the occasion as a pretext to ban the Futurists from performing on stage. Having won 65 rubles in lottery, in May 1914 Mayakovsky went to Kuokola, near Petrograd. Here he put the finishing touches to a cloud in trousers, frequented Cornish Yukovsky's dacha, sat for a Lyrapin's painting sessions and met Maxim Gorky for the first time. As World War I began, Mayakovsky volunteered but was rejected as politically unreliable. He worked for a time at the Lubok Today Company which produced patriotic Lubok pictures, 
and in the NOV newspaper, which published several of his anti-war poems. In summer 1915 Mayakovsky moved to Petrograd where he started contributing to the new Satyricon magazine, writing mostly humorous verse in the vein of Sashachini, one of the journal's former stalwarts. Then Maxim Gorky invited the poet to work for his journal, Lutopi. In June of that year Mayakovsky fell in love with a married woman, Lilia Breek, who eagerly took upon herself the role of a muse. Her husband Osip Breek seemed not to mind and became the poet's close friend. Later he published several books by Mayakovsky and used his entrepreneurial talents to support the futurist movement. This love affair, as well as his impressions of World War I and socialism, strongly influenced Mayakovsky's best-known works, A Cloud in Trousers, his first major poem of appreciable length, followed by Backbone Flute, The War on the World and the Man. When his mobilization form finally arrived in the autumn of 1915, Mayakovsky found himself unwilling to go to the front lines. Assisted by Gorky, he joined the Petrograd Military Driving School as a draftsman and was studying there until early 1917. In 1916 Paris publishers, published Mayakovsky's poetry compilation called Simple as Mooing. 1917 A Euro 1927 Mayakovsky embraced the Bolshevik Russian Revolution wholeheartedly and for a while even worked in Smolny, Petrograd, where he saw Vladimir Lenin and was rubbing shoulders with the revolutionary soldiers. To accept or not to accept, there was no such question a euro, that was my revolution, he wrote in I, myself autobiography. In November 1917 he took part in the Communist Party's Central Committee sanctioned assembly of writers, painters and theatre directors who expressed their allegiance to the new political regime. In December that year the Left March was premiered at the The Navy Theatre, with sailors as an audience. In 1918 Mayakovsky started the short-lived Futurist paper. He also starred in three silent films made at the Ntan Studios in Petrograd he had written scripts for. The only surviving one, The Young Lady and the Hooligan, was based on the La Maestrina di Gli Operai published in 1895 by Edmondo de Amici's, and directed by Evni Slavinsky. The other two, Born Not for the Money and Shackled by Film were directed by Nikan Turkin and are presumed lost. On November 7, 1918 Mayakovsky's play Mystery Booth was premiered in the Petrograd Musical Drama Theatre. Representing a universal flood and the subsequent joyful triumph of the unclean over the clean, this satirical drama was reworked in 1921 to even greater popular acclaim. However, the author's attempt to make a film of the play failed, the Moscow Soviet finding its language incomprehensible for the masses. In March 1919 Mayakovsky moved back to Moscow where Vladimir Mayakovsky's collected works 1909 a Euro 1919 was released. The same month he started working for the Russian State Telegraph Agency creating a Euro both graphic and text to Euro satirical agitprop posters, aimed mostly at informing the counter Euro unregistered trademark s largely illiterate population of the current events. In the cultural climate of the early Soviet Union, his popularity grew rapidly, even if among the members of the first Bolshevik government, only Anatoly Lunacharsky supported him. Others treated the futurist art more skeptically. Mayakovsky's 1921 poem 150000 failed to impress Lenin, who apparently saw in it little more than a formal futuristic experiment. More favorably received by the Soviet leader was his next one, Reconferences, which came out in April. A vigorous spokesman for the Communist Party, Mayakovsky expressed himself in many ways. Contributing simultaneously to numerous Soviet newspapers, he poured out topical propagandistic verses and wrote didactic booklets for children while lecturing and reciting all over Russia. In May 1922, after a performance at the House of Publishing at the charity auction collecting money for the victims of Povel's high famine, he went abroad for the first time, visiting Riga, Berlin and Paris where he visited the studios of La Copyright Guerre and Picasso. Several books, including The West Cycle and The Poem Paris, Talking with the Eiffel Tower, came out as a result. From 1922 to 1928, Mayakovsky was a prominent member of the Left Art Front he helped to found and for a while defined his work as communist futurism. 
He edited, along with Sergei Tyakov and Osip Brik, the journal LEF, its stated objective being re-examining the ideology and practices of the so-called leftist art, rejecting individualism and increasing art's value for the developing communism. The journal's first, March 1923, issue featured Mayakovsky's poem about that. Regarded as a LEF manifesto, it soon came out as a book illustrated by Alexander Rudchenko who also used some photographs made by Mayakovsky and Lilia Breek. In May 1923 Mayakovsky spoke at a massive protest rally in Moscow, in the wake of Vorslav Vorovsky's assassination. In October 1924 he gave numerous public readings of the 3,000-line epic Vladimir Ilyich Lenin written on the death of the Soviet communist leader. Next February it came out as a book, published by Gesizdat. Five years later Mayakovsky's rendition of the third part of the poem, at the Lenin Memorial Evening in the Bolshoi Theater ended with 20 minutes ovation. In May 1925 Mayakovsky's second trip took him to several European cities, then to the United States, Mexico and Cuba. The book of essays My Discovery of America came out later that year. In January 1927 the first issue of the new LEF magazine came out, again under Mayakovsky's supervision, now focusing on the documentary art. In all, 24 issues of it came out. In October 1927 Mayakovsky recited his new poem All Right. For the audience of the Moscow Party Conference activists in the Moscow's Red Hall. In November 1927 a theatre production called The 25th was premiered in the Leningrad Mali Opera Theatre. In summer 1928, disillusioned with LEF, he left both the organization and its magazine. 1929 a Euro 1930. In 1929 the publishing house Gosletized at released the works by V. V. Mayakovsky in four volumes. In September 1929 the first assembly of the newly formed REF group gathered with Mayakovsky in the chair. But behind this four section A the poet's relationship with the Soviet literary establishment was quickly deteriorating. Both the REF organized exhibition of Mayakovsky's work, celebrating the 20th anniversary of his literary career and the parallel event in the Writers' Club, 20 years of work in February 1930, were ignored by the RAPP members and, more importantly, the party leadership, particularly Stalin whose attendance he was greatly anticipating. It was becoming evident that the experimental art was no longer welcomed by the regime, and the country's most famous poet irritated a lot of people. Two of Mayakovsky's satirical plays, written specifically for Mirkhold Theater, The Bed Bug and The Bathhouse evoked stormy criticism from the Russian Association of Proletarian Writers. In February 1930 Mayakovsky joined RAPP, only to find himself labeled Pupuchik which from the days of Lenin amounted to a potentially deadly political accusation. The smear campaign was started in the Soviet press, sporting slogans like Down with Mayakovshchina. On April 9, 1930 Mayakovsky, reading his new poem at the top of my voice, was shouted down by the student audience, for being too obscure. Equals death equals, on April 12, 1930, Mayakovsky was for the last time seen in public, he took part in the discussion at the Savnaka meeting concerning the proposed copyright law. On April 14, 1930, his current partner, actress Veronica Polonskaya, upon leaving his flat, heard a shot behind the closed door. She rushed in and found the poet lying on the floor. He apparently shot himself through the heart. The handwritten death note read, to all of you. I die, but don't blame anyone for it, and please do not gossip. The deceased terribly disliked this sort of thing. Mother, sisters, comrades, forgive me Euro this is not a good method, but there is no other way out for me. Lilia Euro love me. Comrade government, my family consists of Lily Breek, Mama, my sisters, and Veronica Vitoldovna Polonskaya. If you can provide a decent life for them, thank you. Give the poem I started to the bricks. The Euro unregistered trademark LL understand. The unfinished poem in his suicide note read, in part, and so they say a Euro the incident dissolved slash the love boat smashed up slash and the dreary routine. Slash I'm through with life slash and, we should absolve slash from mutual hurts, 
afflictions and spleen. Mayakovsky's funeral on April 17, 1930, was attended by around 150,000, the third largest event of public mourning in Soviet history, surpassed only by those of Vladimir Lenin and Joseph Stalin he was interred at the Moscow Novodevichy Cemetery. Controversy Surrounding Death On the day of Mayakovsky's death, April 14, ROSTA published a news bulletin, reprinted in Pravda the following day, that read in part, the suicide was caused by reasons of a purely personal order, having nothing in general to do with the public and literary activity of the poet, the suicide was preceded by an illness from which the poet still had not completely recovered. Mayakovsky's suicide occurred after a dispute with Polonskaya, with whom he had a brief but unstable romance. Polonskaya was in love with the poet, but unwilling to leave her husband, she was the last one who saw Mayakovsky alive. But, as Lilia Breek stated in her memoirs, the idea of suicide was like a chronic disease inside him, and like any chronic disease it worsened under circumstances that, for him, were undesirable. According to Polonskaya, Mayakovsky mentioned suicide on April 13, when the two were at Valentin Katev's place, but she thought he was trying to emotionally blackmail her and refused to believe for a second, he could do such a thing. Yet speculation has occurred regarding the circumstances of Mayakovsky's death. It appeared that the suicide note was written two days before his death. Soon after the poet's death Lilia and Osip Bricks were hastily sent abroad. The bullet removed from his body didn't match the model of his pistol, and his neighbors were later reported to say they'd heard two shots. Ten days later, the officer investigating the poet's suicide was himself killed, fueling speculation about the nature of Mayakovsky's death. Such speculation, often alluding to suspicion of murder by state services, especially intensified during the periods of Khrushchevian de Stalinization, Glasnost, and Perestroika, as Soviet politicians sought to weaken Stalin's reputation and the positions of contemporary opponents. According to Chantal Sundaram, the extent to which rumors of Mayakovsky's murder remained widespread is indicated by the fact that even as late as the end of 1991 they prompted the state Mayakovsky Museum to commission an expert medical and criminological inquiry into the material evidence of his death kept in the museum, photographs, the shirt with traces from the gunshot, the carpet on which Mayakovsky fell, and the authenticity of the suicide note. The possibility of a forgery, suggested by Andrei Kolaskov had survived as a theory with different variants. But the results of a detailed handwriting analysis found that the suicide note was undoubtedly written by Mayakovsky, and also included the conclusion that its irregularities depict a diagnostic complex, testifying to the influence. At the moment of execution, of disconcerting factors, among which the most probable is a psychophysiological state linked with agitation. Although the findings are hardly surprising, the event is indicative of a fascination with Mayakovsky's contradictory relationship with the Soviet authorities which survived into the era of perestroika, despite the fact that he was being attacked and rejected for his political conformism at this time. Equals private life equals, Mayakovsky met husband and wife Osip and Lilia Bricks in July 1915 at their dacha in Malakhova nearby Moscow. Soon after that Lilia's sister Elsa, who'd had a brief affair with a poet before, invited him to the Bricks Petrograd flat. The couple at the time showed no interest in literature and were successful corals traders. That evening Mayakovsky recited the yet unpublished poem A Cloud in Trousers and announced it as dedicated to the hostess. That was the happiest day in my life, was how he referred to the episode in his autobiography years later. According to Lilia Briggs memoirs, her husband too fell in love with the poet, whereas Volodya did not merely fall in love with me. He attacked me, it was an assault. For two and a half years I didn't have a moment's peace. I understood right away that Volodya was a genius, but I didn't like him. I didn't like clamorous people. I didn't like the fact that he was so tall and people in the street would stare at him. I was annoyed that he enjoyed listening to his own voice. I couldn't even stand the name Mayakovsky. Sounding so much like a cheap pen name. Both Mayakovsky's persistent adoration and rough appearance irritated her. It was, 
allegedly, to please her, that Mayakovsky attended a dentist, started to wear a bow tie and use a walking stick. Soon after a seat break published A Cloud in Trousers in September 1915, Mayakovsky settled in the Palace Royal Hotel at the Pushkinskaya Street, Petrograd, not far from where they lived. He introduced the couple to his futurist friends and the Bricks flat quickly evolved into a modern literary salon. From then on Mayakovsky was dedicating every one of his large poems to Lilia. Such dedications later started to appear even in the texts he had written before they met, much to her displeasure. In summer 1918, soon after Lilia and Vladimir starred in the film Encased in a Film, Mayakovsky and the Bricks moved in together. In March 1919 all three came to Moscow and in 1920 settled in a flat at the Gondrykov Lane, Teganka. In 1920 Mayakovsky had a brief romance with Lilia Levinskaya, an artist who also contributed to her OSTA. She gave birth to a son, Gleb Nikita Levinsky, later a Soviet sculptor. In 1922 Lilia Breek fell in love with Alexander Krasnoshkyokov, the head of the Soviet Prom Bank. This affair resulted in the three months rift, which was to some extent reflected in the poem about that. Breek and Mayakovsky's relationships ended in 1923, but they never parted. Now I am free from placards and love, he confessed in the poem called for the Jubilee. Still, when in 1926 Mayakovsky was granted a state-owned flat at the Gendrikov Lane in Moscow, all three of them moved in and lived there until 1930, having turned the place into the LEF headquarters. Mayakovsky continued to profess his devotion to Lilia whom he considered a family member. It was Breek who in the mid-1930s famously addressed Stalin with a personal letter which made all the difference in the way poet's legacy has been treated since in the USSR. Still, she had many detractors who regarded her insensitive femme fatale and cynical manipulator, who'd never been really interested in either Mayakovsky or his poetry. To me, she was a kind of monster. But Mayakovsky apparently loved her that way, armed with a whip, remembered poet Andrei Bozinashinsky who knew Lilia Breek personally. Literary critic and historian Viktor Shklovsky who resented what he saw as the Breek's exploitation of Mayakovsky both when he lived and after his death, once called them a family of corpse mongers. In summer 1925 Mayakovsky traveled to New York, where he met Russian copyright migra copyright Ellie Jones, born Yelizaveta Petrovna Zibet, an interpreter who spoke Russian, French, German and English fluently. They fell in love, for three months were inseparable, but decided to keep their affair secret. Soon after the poets returned to the Soviet Union, Ellie gave birth to daughter Patricia. Mayakovsky saw the girl just once, in Nice, France, in 1928, when she was three. Patricia Thompson, a professor of philosophy and women's studies at Lehman College in New York City, is the author of the book Mayakovsky in Manhattan, in which she told the story of her parents' love affair, relying on her mother's unpublished memoirs and their private conversations prior to her death in 1985. Thompson traveled to Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union, looking for her roots was welcomed there with respect and since then started to use her Russian name, Yelena Vladimirovna Mayakovskaya. In 1928 in Paris Mayakovsky met Russian a copyright migra copyright to Chiana Yakovleva, a 22-year-old model working for the Chanel Fashion House. He fell in love madly and wrote two poems dedicated to her, Letter to Comrade Kostrov on the Essence of Love, and Letter to Tatiana Yakovleva. Some argued that. Since it was Elsa Trilet who acquainted them, the liaison might have been the result of Breek's intrigue, aimed at stopping the poet from getting closer to Ellie Jones and especially daughter Patricia, but the power of this passion apparently caught her by surprise. Mayakovsky tried to persuade Tatiana to return to Russia but she refused. In the late 1929 he made an attempt to travel to Paris in order to marry her lover but was refused a visa for the first time, again, as many believed due to Lilia's making full use of her numerous connections. It became known that she accidentally read Mayakovsky out a letter from Paris alleging that Tatiana was getting married, while, as it turned out soon, the latter's wedding wasn't on the agenda at that very moment. 
Lydia Shukovskaya insisted it was the ever-powerful Yakov Agrinov, another one of Lilia's lovers, who prevented Mayakovsky's getting a visa, upon her request. In the late 1920s Mayakovsky had two more affairs, with student Natalia Bryakhanenko and with Veronika Polonskaya, a young M.A.T. actress, then the wife of actor Mikhail Yanchin. It was Veronika's unwillingness to divorce the latter that resulted in her rose with Mayakovsky, the last of which preceded the poet's suicide. Yet, according to Natalia Bryakhanenko, it was not Polonskaya but Yakov Leva whom he was pining for. In January 1929 Mayakovsky, told me hey Euro would put a bullet to his brain if he didn't see that woman any time soon, she later remembered. Which, on April 14, 1930, he did. Works. Though immature, Mayakovsky's early poems established him as one of the more original poets to come out of the Russian Futurism, a movement rejecting the traditional poetry in favor of formal experimentation, and welcoming the social change promised by modern technology. His 1913 verses, surreal, seemingly disjointed and nonsensical, relying on forceful rhythms and exaggerated imagery with the words split into pieces and staggered across the page, were peppered with street language, considered unpoetic in literary circles at the time. While the confrontational aesthetics of his fellow futurist group members' poetry were mostly confined to formal experiments, Mayakovsky's idea was creating the new, democratic language of the streets. In 1914 his first large work, an avant-garde tragedy Vladimir Mayakovsky came out. A fierce critique of the city life and capitalism in general was, at the same time, a peon to the modern industrial power, featuring the protagonist sacrificing himself for the sake of the people's happiness in the future. In September 1915 A Cloud in Trousers came out, Mayakovsky's first major poem of appreciable length. It depicted the heated subjects of love, revolution, religion and art, written from the vantage point of a spurned lover. The language of the work was the language of the streets, and Mayakovsky went to considerable lengths to debunk idealistic and romanticized notions of poetry and poets. It was followed by the backbone flute which again outraged contemporary critics who described the author as talentless charlatan, spurning empty words of a malaria sufferer. Some even recommended that he'd be hospitalized immediately. In retrospect it is seen as a groundbreaking piece, introducing the new forms of expressing social anger and personal frustrations. 1917 A Euro 1921 was a fruitful period for the poet, who greeted the Bolshevik Revolution with a number of poetic and dramatic works, starting with Ode to the Revolution, and Left March, a hymn to the proletarian might calling for the fight against the enemies of the revolution. Mystery Booth, the first Soviet play, told the story of a new Noah's Ark, built by the unclean sporting moral cleanness, and united by the class solidarity. In 1919 a Euro 1921 Mayakovsky worked for the Russian Telegraph Agency. Painting posters and cartoons, he provided them with app rhymes and slogans which were describing the current events in dynamics. In three years he produced some 1100 pieces he called our OSTA windows. In 1921 Mayakovsky's poem 150 arrived, hailing the Russian people's mission in igniting the world revolution, but failed to impress Lenin. The latter praised the 1922 poem Reconferences, a scathing satire on the nascent Soviet bureaucracy starting to eat up the apparently flawed state system. Mayakovsky's poetry was saturated with politics, but no amount of social propaganda could stifle his personal need for love. It came out most strongly in two poems, I Love and About That, both dedicated to Lilia Breek. Even after Mayakovsky's relationship with this woman ended, he considered her one of the people closest to him and a member of his family. In October 1924 appeared Vladimir Like Lenin written on the death of the Soviet communist leader. While the newspapers reported of highly successful public performances, the Soviet literary critics had their reservations, G. Lulovic calling it cerebral and rhetorical, Victor Partsov mentioning wordiness, cringworthy naivety and clumsiness. Mayakovsky's extensive foreign trips resulted in the books of poetry, as well as a set of analytical satirical essays. 
In 1926 Mayakovsky wrote and published Talking with the Taxman about poetry, the first in a series of works criticizing the new Soviet philistinism, the result of the new economic policy. His 1927 epic, All Right, sought to unite heroic pathos with lyricism and irony. Extolling the new Bolshevik Russia as the springtime of the humankind it was praised by Lunacharsky as the October Revolution set in bronze. In his last three years Mayakovsky completed two satirical plays, The Bed Bug, and The Bath House, both lampooning bureaucratic stupidity and opportunism. The latter was extolled by Vsevolod Mielerold who rated it as high as the best work of Moliere, Pushkin and Gogol and called it the greatest phenomenon of the history of the Russian theater. A fierce criticism both plays were met with in the Soviet press was overstated and politically charged, but still, in retrospect Mayakovsky's work in the 1920s is regarded as patched, even his most famous poems, Vladimir Alike Lenin and All Right, looking inferior to his passionate and innovative 1910s work. Several authors, among them Valentin Katerlev and close friend Boris Pasternak, reproached him for squandering enormous potential on petty propaganda. The harsh assessment of the poet's later efforts came from Marina Tsvtaeva, who in her 1932 essay The Art in the Light of Conscience commented this way on his death, for twelve years Mayakovsky the man was destroying Mayakovsky the poet. On the thirteenth year the poet rose up and killed the Mani Euro his suicide lasted twelve years, not for a moment he pulled the trigger. Legacy after Mayakovsky's death the Association of the Proletarian Writers' Leadership made sure the publications of the poet's work were cancelled and his very name stopped being mentioned in the Soviet press. In her 1935 letter to Yosef Stalin, Lilia Breek challenged her opponents, asking personally the Soviet leader for help. Stalin's resolution inscribed upon this message, read. Comrade Yezhev, please take charge of Breek's letter. Mayakovsky is the best and the most talented poet of our Soviet epoch. Indifference to his cultural heritage amounts to a crime. Breek's complaints are, in my opinion, justified. The effect of this letter was startling. Mayakovsky was instantly hailed a Soviet classic, proving to be the only member of the artistic avant-garde of the early 20th century to enter the Soviet mainstream. His birthplace of Badati in Georgia was renamed Mayakovsky in his honor. In 1937 the Mayakovsky Museum were opened in Moscow. Triumphal Square in Moscow became Mayakovsky Square. In 1938 the Mayakovsky Air Metro Station was opened to the public. Nikolai Asuev received a Stalin Prize in 1941 for his poem Mayakovsky Starts Here, which celebrated him as a poet of the revolution. In 1974 the Russian State Museum of Mayakovsky opened in the center of Moscow in the building where Mayakovsky resided from 1919 to 1930. But the flip side of this achievement was catastrophic. For the Soviet readership Mayakovsky ceased being anything other than the poet of the revolution, his legacy censored, more intimate or controversial pieces ignored, lines taken out of contexts and turned into slogans. The major rebel of his generation was turned into a symbol of the repressive state. The Stalin-sanctioned canonization has dealt Mayakovsky, according to Boris Pasternak, the second death, as the communist authorities started to impose him forcibly, like Catherine the Great did the potatoes. In the late 1950s and early 1960s Mayakovsky's popularity in the Soviet Union started to rise again with the new generation of writers recognizing him as a purveyor of artistic freedom and daring experimentation. Mayakovsky's face is etched on the altar of the century, Boris Pasternak wrote at that time. Young poets, drawn to avant-garde art and activism that often clashed with communist dogma, chose Mayakovsky's statue in Moscow for their organized poetry readings. Among the Soviet authors he influenced were Valentin Kaev. Andrei Voznashinsky and Yevgeny Yevtrushenko. In 1967 the Teganka Theatre staged the poetical performance Listen Here. Based on Mayakovsky's works with the leading role given to Vladimir Vysotsky, who was also much inspired by Mayakovsky's poetry. Mayakovsky became well known and studied outside of the USSR. Poets such as Narsensar Plus or Minus M. Hikmet, 
Louis Aragon and Pablo Neruda acknowledged having been influenced by his work. He was the most influential futurist in Lithuania and his poetry helped to form the Four Winds movement there. Mayakovsky was a significant influence on American poet Frank O'Hara. O'Hara's 1957 poem Mayakovsky, 1957, contains many references to Mayakovsky's life and works, in addition to a true account of talking to the sun at Fire Island, a variation on Mayakovsky's An Extraordinary Adventure that happened to Vladimir Mayakovsky one summer at a dacha. 1986 English singer and songwriter Billy Bragg recorded the album Talking with the Taxman about poetry, named after Mayakovsky's poem of the same name. In 2007 Craig Vokes stage biodrama Mayakovsky Takes the Stage won the Penn USA Literary Award for Best Stage Drama. In the Soviet Union's final years there was a strong tendency to view Mayakovsky's work as dated and insignificant. There were even calls for banishing his poems from school textbooks. Yet on the basis of his best works, Mayakovsky a Euro unregistered trademark s reputation was revived and attempts have been made to recreate an objective picture of his life and legacy. Mayakovsky was credited as a radical reformer of the Russian poetic language who created his own linguistic system charged with a new kind of expressionism, which in many ways influenced the development of the Soviet and world poetry. The Raging Bull of Russian Poetry, The Wizard of Rhyming, an individualist and a rebel against established taste and standards, Mayakovsky is seen by many in Russia as a truly revolutionary force and the greatest rebel in the 20th century Russian literature. Works. Equals poems equals, A Cloud in Trousers, Backbone Flute, The War on the World, The Man, 150000000, About That, Vladimir Alike Lenin, Paris, A Flying Proletarian, All Right. Poem Cycles and Collections, The Early Ones I Satires 1913 A Euro 1927, The War, Lyrics, Revolution, Everyday Life, The Art of the Commune, A Guide Poems, The West, The American Poems, On Poetry, The Satires 1926, Lyrics. 1918 A Euro 1924, Publicism, The Children's Room, Poems. 1927 A Euro 1928, Satires 1928, Cultural Revolution, A Gita Euro, Th Th Cube Th Euro, 1928, 44 Poems, Including Yid, Rhodes, The First of Five, Back and Forth, Formidable Laughter, Poems, 1924 A Euro 1930, Whom Shall I Become? Equals Plays Equals, Vladimir Mayakovsky, Mystery Booth, The Bed Bug, The Bath House, Moscow Burns. 1905. Equals Essays and Sketches equals, My Discovery of America, in Four Parts, How to Make Verses. Literature. References. External links.